The other thing that the Marine Corps had going for them is a very special unit that was developed just before this, and that's going to be the Marine Raiders, cool. which were stood back up while you and I were in the Marine Corps. They had been gone since World War II, and for, for the first time since World War II, they were stood back up, first as MARSOC, and All then right. then became known as Marine Corps Raiders again. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, early in the war, Chester Nimitz is going to request commando units, in air quotes, uh, to, com- to conduct raids against slightly defended Japanese-held islands. The commandant's going to select the term raiders because he doesn't like the idea of copying the British with the term commandos. To be honest with you, the commandant at the time didn't want to call them anything. He said the term marine would do just fine. <laughs> how many how many marines, how many higher-up marines have you met that would say the same yeah. thing today, right? Oh, good, yeah. <laughs> You're a marine. Yeah. You don't need any other title. Well, they're, they're, they are marines, but they're also special. <laughs> It's, we can give them another name. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but that being said, uh, there were going to be two battalions created. The first Raider Battalion is going to be activated on February 16th, 1942. It's going to be commanded by Lieutenant Colonel, later Major General, Merritt A. Red Mike Edson. Um, the second Raider Battalion is going to be activated on February 19th, 1942, and they're going to be commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Evans F. Carlson. It's funny because they, they bear the same name, but the two units are, are not, they're very different from each other. And we're going to get into that here. Now, Raider Battalions as a whole are going to receive first priority in the Marine Corps on men and equipment. So they get, to, they get to comb the Marine Corps for the best of the best. And they also get their first pick of the weapons. I've seen that. <laughs> right? <laughs> so right off the gate, they're, they're, they're winning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Edson and Carlson are going to comb the ranks of the respected divisions and also siphoned off many of the best men pouring in from recruit depots. Uh, they had no difficulty attracting volunteers. The promise was they would be the first to fight the Japanese. And at this time, you know, in, in, in the wake of Pearl Harbor and Midway and, uh, and um, Wake Island, everybody wants to get a hold of the Japanese. Yeah, everybody's eager know? for that chance. Um, the Raiders also had a carte blanche, uh, had carte blanche to obtain equipment, um, whether or not it was standard or issued, they, they could pick out whatever they wanted and it played into how they organized their units. Uh, we'll start off with the second Raider battalion because they are, when, when considering what modern day special forces is, the second Raider battalion is the most similar to them. Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of explain the difference between the two first and second Raider battalions and how they were organized and operated. But uh, Carlson approached training his second Raiders quite differently from the traditional doctrine of the Marine Corps. He reorganized his battalion, forming six rifle companies of two platoons each, and, a th- and each platoon would have three-man fire teams as its base unit. You know, you and I had four-man fire teams. Yeah. That's pretty standard for what the Marine Corps had, at least towards the end of the war. Uh, Carlson wanted three-man fire teams. And to give you a little background on Carlson, Carlson spent a lot of time in China. Like, they had the term China Marines yeah. back then. Uh, and he was he learned from Chinese guerrillas. He, he studied them. He went on patrols with them. He watched how they operated. Even the term gung-ho is a Chinese term. Uh, and I have in here, it means work together. All That'll right. be the slogan for the 2nd Raider Battalion. Yeah. He reorganizes his his battalion very differently because for you and I— we would have four companies, right? You'd have a, you have three line companies, which yeah. are which are r- rifle companies, yep. and then one weapons company. In a line company, you have three line platoons and one weapon platoon, and then each platoon has three squads, two or three, depending on how well staffed you are. But three squads yeah. ideally, um, and then the weapons platoon would be tasked out to those lines line platoons. And weapons platoons are, you know, your mortars, machine gun, and then assault men. At the time, back then, at least later in the war, will be uh, your flamethrower guys. Uh, Carlson takes a very different approach. Each fire team, these three-man fire teams, are going to have a Thompson submachine gun, a Browning automatic rifle, and the new M1 Garand, which is a semi-fired, you know, semi-automatic rifle instead of the bolt-action 1903 Springfields. Yeah, that's the setup right there in a small unit. So right off the rip, his units can boast extreme firepower at all at all distances, right? You have one guy; he can be super accurate with that M1 Garand. You got another guy that can lay down long distance machine gun fire with the BAR, and then if you have to get into some close fighting, you got the guy with the you know the the 45 millimeter Thompson. Right? Yeah. He can just rock and roll all day long. Um, 
He also uh, inculcated the unit with an unconventional military philosophy. That's it's a mixture of Chinese culture, communist egalitarianism, uh, and New England town hall democracy. So, meaning, uh, kind of sum that up: every man is going to have the right to say what he thought about you know the practices and what's happening in the unit. And their battle cry is going to be, as I mentioned before, gung ho. But the most impressive thing about this mindset is, is that officers would no longer have greater privileges than the men they commanded. Rank didn't just give you perks for having rank. Uh, they would lead by consensus rather than rank. So essentially, it sounds like they got to pick their commanders. Whoever was the, the highest performer, the hardest charger, would be the guy in charge. That's really cool. Right? I, I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty interesting and unique. Now, they would also be ethical in their doctrination. Carlson described it as giving conviction through persuasion. Uh, basically, he wanted to ensure that every man knew what they were fighting for and why they were fighting for it. He's rarely going to grant liberty. Uh, sometimes he be, he's even going to hold musters in the middle of the night just to catch anyone that tried to sneak off for a night on the town. Right? So he takes that very seriously. He keeps all his guys sequestered at, a, at, a, at their camp. Mm. Um, their training is going to focus heavily on Weapons practice, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, excuse me, demolitions, and physical conditioning to include an emphasis on long hikes. You and I are very uh, familiar with those. They suck. But if you're going to be in an elite unit, you got to be able to do it. Hence, yep. that's why units like Delta Force, their entire selection process is rucking. I mean, really, that's what it boils down to. There's numerous books on this. There's been numerous interviews on it. It's rucking, right? how good you are at rucking long distances yep. over rough terrain. As the men grew tougher and acquired field skills, he started shifting their focus to more night work. And again, in an era where there is no night vision capability, you have to train it because it's going to be super difficult if you don't. Yeah, they're going to be out there. Carlson's system of organization and training was designed to create a force suited for infiltration and the attainment of, object of objectives by unorthodox and unexpected methods. He really is trying to make a raiding force, a guerrilla force, right? That's why I say they're more in line with special forces we think of today. Right. At least, at least like the super elite ones. Like, Del, you know, a, 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 a thing that people don't quite understand when, when you're breaking down the difference between all these um, special forces units. When it comes to, like, Delta Force, what's the difference between Delta Force and the Green Berets? I don't know. I could go into a big, long spiel on this. But the Green Berets are unconventional military units, but they're designed to work in a conventional capacity, right? They go, okay. they go insert, and they work with local national units, and they train them up and then lead them into battle. Or if they're doing, like, direct action, it's still – it's unconventional methods. They infiltrate and do all this stuff, but they're operating as a conventional military unit in a sense. Delta Force is an anti-terrorism unit, and I read this in a um, – I can't remember what what Delta Force book it was, but the idea behind becoming the best anti-terrorism organization is you first have to be the best terrorist organization, right? Yeah, uh, think like your enemy. Right. I mean, that's essentially they're just the highest level of terrorists. Now, they operate for a government. They don't operate out of fear, but their capabilities wise, you know, you think about it's a lot more it's a lot more in the shadows, right, than than what a. uh I don't know, a conventional Green Beret unit would do. That's what Carlson is shooting for. He's he's trying to make his guys kings at operating in the shadows. Small units, in and out, quick. Very similar to the SAS at the, at, in World War II. Yeah, creative Now at that time. Lieutenant Colonel Edson, he's going to train his first Raiders, the first Raider battalion, a lot more traditionally than Carlson does, his second Raiders. Um Edson's battalion is going to retain the table of organization that had been designed by the Marine Corps. Uh, it's based on an eight-man squad with a squad leader, two, ba two BAR men, four riflemen armed with the 1903 Springfield, so he keeps the bolt-action rifles, even though he has, you know, he has his pick of any weapon he yeah. wants to get. And we could get into why, at the time, guys thought it would be better to have bolt-action rifles here a little bit. They thought two things. One, they thought it would conserve ammunition because if everybody could just pull the trigger as many times as they wanted, they would burn through their ammunition too quick. Same kind of thinking that uh, went into um, General Custer's men having breech-loading rifles instead of lever-action rifles at the, battle, uh, at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Yeah. 
Saves ammo and well aimed shots. That's, well, that's the, the other Corps. one. Well thing. aimed shots, right? They the that bolt action rifles are gonna be more accurate yeah. um than than a semi automatic rifle. Needless to say, that idea doesn't stick around for too long. <laughs> <laughs> um on top of that, each squad is also gonna have a sniper. So they'll have the the Springfield, the nineteen oh three Springfield with a telescopic sight. So having smaller squads then now he, Carlson has the smaller fire teams, but Edson has overall smaller squads than Carlson's units do. Because, again, Carlson has two platoons per company, right. whereas Edson's going to have three. Um, so with smaller squads, his companies contain three rifle platoons, a weapons platoon, very traditional, um, and a weapons company that provided additional light machine gun and 60-millimeter mortars. Um, training is very similar to that of the Second Raiders, with the exception of uh, two things that really stood out. One, they're going to focus a lot more on rubber, rubber boat work uh, due to the convenient location that they where they were based out at Quantico. It's it's right there on the Potomac River. Yeah. Uh, and this is the one that really, really, really stood out to me. Uh, the first raiders also strove to reach a pace of seven miles per hour on hikes. Let me just Oof. emphasize how psycho that is oh, so to this much. day. Marine Corps, like the the average pace for a Marine Corps infantry unit, even like even even recon unit would be three and a half miles an hour. It and listen, when you're loaded down with with a, all your hump gear, three and a half miles an hour for twenty miles, thirty miles, dude, you are broke off you're at the end of that. Out, man. That is moving. Like I, if you're interested in figuring out what it feels like, go put on a pack. This isn't even a full hump load. Go put on a pack with 50 pounds in it. That's like, yeah. that's minimal hump load. Get on a treadmill and set that thing at three and a half miles an hour and see how long you can keep that pace for well, without dying. You, you go until it says 20 miles. Right. right. Then you stop. <laughs> uh, it's Jeez, it's man. not easy. It's not easy. And these guys are going to do seven miles an hour. And they do this uh, by alternating periods of double timing and fast walking. Just terrible. That's whack, man. Makes me think of the scout sniper in Doc. Yeah. Yeah. Which was miserable. <laughs> um, now, although Edson emphasized light infantry tactics, his men were not guerrillas. The difference between the two units, the best that I can make it out to be, is that, like I had mentioned, Carlson is more in line with what Delta Force and the SAS have kind of become, right? The, the, the operating in the shadows, black ops, in and out, raiding style force. Edson's first raiders are going to be more like the 75th Ranger Battalion. And, and that's kind of how I'm equating it to, like, modern-day stuff, right? The 75th Ranger Battalion is definitely a special forces unit. Um, they're, they're the same level asset as Green Berets and Navy SEALs. But they are a strike, for, a, a strike force, right? So they, they, they seize airfields. They, um, when they had to rescue uh, uh, Marcus Luttrell after Operation uh -huh. Red Wing... It's the 75th Rangers that are going to launch this huge operation to go in and get him. Okay. Um, so they're the, they're the, they're a special forces unit, but they're the hammer of special forces. They operate as an infantry unit would. They're just better at it than an infantry yeah. unit. You they're know going, what I mean? They're going right their guys the are more they're more fit. Uh, they can march further. They can march faster. They're better with their weapons. They have better gear. You know, you name it from top to bottom. They're just a, the highest class infantry unit you can get into. But they're special. There's I want to emphasize that. Both the 75th Ranger Battalion, a regiment, I'm sorry, 75th Ranger Regiment and Edson's Raiders are special forces. Very special. <laughs> now, Edson's style of leadership is also going to be very much, very different from Carlson's style. Whereas Carlson, you know, he, he almost strips away the military from his unit, right? Rank doesn't mean anything. You don't get privilege from rank. It's a, it's a merit-based organization, Right. Uh, you have to know what you're fighting for, believe in what you're fighting for. Um, everybody's on the same page. Edson's going to be a little more traditional than that. He's going to encourage initiative in his subordinates, but rank is going to carry both responsibility and authority for decision-making, as well as perks. Um, he uh, He's going to give his raiders regular liberty. He's even going to organize dances <laughs> where, he, where he has busloads of secretaries driven down from the nearby Washington, D.C. Uh, to come dance and party with his Marine Imagine Raiders on base. I, I mean, it's night and day different from Carlson's battalion. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, Edson is also a quiet guy who has uh, a, a very prolific history before this ever takes place, and he has an ability 
to inspire his guys, not through speeches, but through his actions. He's a, he's a master on the rifle range. He's a, he's, he's a tough, rough, you know, hard charging Marine, right. And somebody that his guys would follow to the pits of hell and back right. again. Yeah. Right. All that to say the Marine Raider battalions are very different in almost every aspect. The one thing they do have in common is excellent training and a desire to excel in battle and a desire to get into battle with the enemy. Yeah, uh, both very capable. Hey, quick question for you, right off the hip. Which one would you rather be in? You know, I was thinking about that, writing it. Um, probably Carlson's Raiders, man. Yeah. I like the notion. I There are things that I like about Edson's Raiders. I like, you know, as, as sucky as it would be, you know, I'd be pretty proud if my unit was known for marching seven miles yeah. per hour with, with a hump load, you know? Yeah, it's tough, um, man. But that being said... Uh, I think Carlson, Carlson, there's something uh, attractive about the way Carlson approached his unit. Um, the the merit based organization, everybody, and 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 the, and the communication. Everybody knows the mission. Everybody knows why they're doing the mission. Everybody can weigh in on their thought, like their thoughts on the mission. For instance, one of my That's, favorite things that happened when you and I we were getting ready to go to Afghanistan and we got split up between. You know, we were we were both in weapons platoons, so we got tasked out to the line platoons. And, uh, and I'm a lowly E3, man. I, you know, the Marine Corps is known for giving you billets before they give you rank. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I'm a squad leader, but I'm an E3, so I don't carry any rank to back up my billet whatsoever. And I get put in, in my, my line platoon, and I remember we sat down and we were, we were planning a range that had uh, a small rocket on it. We were going to shoot a small rocket. Mm -hmm. That was like the objective, just to maneuver on this, you know, this armored vehicle that we have to take a, a small shot on and uh they're going through the plan all the squad leaders and the platoon leader and we get to the you know the part with a small and they kind of tell me what they're thinking and then then my platoon my platoon leader the lieutenant looks over me and goes well what do you think and i thought man that that is that's the cool. coolest thing that's ever happened because that does not happen normally um and for him to look over and, and ask me that you know because you are the expert on on that you know, that's your job. That's what you do. You do it all the time. Yep. And so to, to be able to weigh in on that and give my opinion, that's why I think why Carlson probably stands out the most to me. It makes sense. What I about can, you? I totally agree with that. I, because of, of Carlson, you know, and that probably that sole point, it would, would sell me as well, because even before the breakdown, before we were officially tasked out to each platoon, we did certain field ops with other platoons when we were, you know, with some some be maneuver elements, some be defense, you know, different field ops. And I can remember uh, platoon commanders, and I'm pretty sure of the one you're talking about right now, would ask me, well, what do you think of this? How about this? You know, you're duty duty expert and you have um, to employ this weapon system at, with your squad attached to my platoon. Well, it makes sense. and um, But unfortunately, where I went, I didn't have that. <laughs> that never happened again. Well, so, but you know, it is what it this is. is a, okay. This is a big teaching point for anybody that's in the military and you don't have to be an officer for this to be a, a teaching point. Yeah. It is never wrong to get the opinions of the guys that you're going to be leading into a fight. It is your responsibility. If you're the guy in charge to make the final decision. Yeah. You know, you do bear the weight of, of decision-making, but, but well-informed incorporating everybody into the plan is never a bad idea. Um, Agreed. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this clip from America Fog of War, catch the rest of the episode here.